Welcome at Deep on Fake, and we're going to discuss how and why artists can be creators of reality using techniques such as deepfake. Uh, I'm here with a uh, very interesting artist, Sohai Buais and uh, Roshan ne Neyal. Um, do I pronounce it well like that? Neyal. Roshan Neyal. All right. So they're going to introduce themselves as well. Uh, I'm a, a a philosopher and artist uh, who is also using pr procedural technology, which is using algorithms as well. Machine learning is uh, also based on algorithms. So Hype will also show some uh, of his work. Um, can you explain what you are doing now? Um, what I'm doing and what I'm going to show, or what I am doing now? What you're going to, well. yeah, what you're doing now. We uh, will go. I'm a, yeah. I'm so I'm a 3D artist from Rotterdam, and. Uh, I mostly do uh, freelance commercial advertising work, but I am at the moment working on a short film with the wild card that I received for my graduation film from last year, which is going to be an autonomous short focused on photo scanning and different cultures, and maybe I can use some machine learning for it as well. Um, yeah. So how did you get involved with uh, machine learning and deepfakes? Um, I will talk about that in my presentation. And I, I, we, we had a project at school where you could just kind of do what you wanted and it was focused on the future of animation. And I started researching um, what some new technologies are that relate to animation. And really quick, quickly I started finding machine learning stuff and I got super mm -hmm. interested in it. And then I did a, uh, a whole project uh, on it. It was very, very difficult. But I just think the new technology is just super interesting, all the different stuff yeah. you can do with. And then it grew out into yeah. something bigger and bigger that yeah. we're, we're going to see that later. Roshan, yes. uh, you are the director of Deepfake Therapy. So the name kind of already gives a hint that you were using Deepfake, but can That's you true. explain what you were doing before actually? Yes, um, I have been uh, graduated on the Dutch Film Academy uh, and uh, in this documentary I am uh, using deepfake technology in uh, a therapeutical way. Uh, so deepfake also is used in a very negative way, you know, to create fake news and it's scary, but uh, I try to use it in, in a different way. Uh, so how can this technology help people? You know, I compare it with a knife. With a knife, you can I can stab you, but I can also make uh, a sandwich. So, <laughs> we, we so try. So you're making sandwiches. Yes, yeah. I try. How can I make a sandwich <laughs> yeah. of, of of it? Yeah, it's it's so. it, it, it's much more than sandwiches. I think it's very intriguing what you made, and we're also gonna uh, look at that. So I really want to give you guys uh, the stage to really present your work and also what inspired you. So uh, so hi you. First, uh, please present uh, what yes. you would like to present. I have prepared a very cool presentation. Yeah. Um, I was, was going to introduce myself here, but I already did that. So, um, so I want to talk about a project that I did uh, about um, two years ago at the Villa Nikoni in my third year there. Um, and like I said, we had this um, assignment where you would, you were kind of really free to make what you wanted for uh, uh, for a semester, and I. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, statistics online of like U.S. jobs being, uh, for, for example, this one from the PwC, 38% of U.S. jobs uh, will be taken over by robots mm -hmm. in about 15 years, which sounds very dystopian. But I was like, I'm studying to be an artist. I'm good. You know, computers are never going to be able to make art, of course. Oh, fuck. This is all made by a computer. Um, okay, yeah, but this is... Just, you know, they're just copying a, a painting style from uh, existing artists. They're not really creating something out of their... So oh, that's also made by computers? Wow. Well, shit. Like, the top left one, if you... It's insane. These are super high-resolution images that are all computer-generated, and you would think it's an actual photograph or a painting. Yeah, so um, these landscapes do not exist. No, they do not exist. Okay. No. Yeah. They're made with uh, deep uh, 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 machine learning algorithms. Um, mm. But so, uh, what I did in um, uh, uh, with my project about machine learning is I, I, I used something called a GAN, which is a generative adversarial network. That's a mouthful. And the way that it basically <laughs> works is that you give it you give it a, a data set of, for example, images, and then it will start to uh, uh, learn from that data set. And it's actually made of 
it's super cool how it works and this is about as far as I understand it because I don't understand this stuff at all but on the surface level how it works it's it's made with uh, two neural networks one of them is a task with generating images based on the data set and uh, the other one is the discriminator and that one's tasked with differentiating between uh, images that are generated and the data set so it gets an image and then it has to say if it came from the generator or it came from the data set yeah. so they're kind of fighting each other and because they have that relationship they both make each other better so it's really yeah. interesting how it works yeah so the the one of the neural networks kind of judges whether the other one exactly, did well yeah, enough yeah yeah and then you don't even have to write you don't even have to write how the generator knows how to get better because mm. it does it itself they, they kind of teach each other so it, it's all like sorted out it's super cool maybe uh, maybe interesting to know that it kind of seems to look like the Turing test like in the the Turing test is is a, a test by Alan Turing mm -hmm. one really big uh, mathematician uh, that really inspired me uh, a lot mm -hmm. uh, and he uh, made a test sort of to he said like okay if if um, if, if if we really get like complex machines we should be able to um, test them also uh, and and not find out that there are machines. If they yeah. can do what we do, we should be able to test it by not finding out, by yeah. not distinguishing the fake ones from the from the real ones, yeah. kind of. And that's exactly what this. It's like this a super neural. meta Turing test. That's yeah. all happening inside and of the AI. And it's happening network. inside of the AI. It's really cool. I don't know how these people AI. come up with this stuff. Yeah. It's super cool. But so. Um, uh, the first thing I want to show is where I used a, uh, a data set of my own work to kind of play devil's advocate and see like, oh, could I replace myself as an artist by a computer? And um, yeah. I created a, <laughs> we'll see if it worked or not, but I created a, a, a digital museum with the idea of like a dystopian future where uh, there's museums that are only, that only consist of computer generated art. I made that last week so I can show it uh, yeah. here. And if you'll see... So these are, these are a block of four by four uh, uh, um, generated images from, from, from the GAN. Mm -hmm. And you can see, you can see it's, it's like, as, as you let it run uh, longer and longer, it will get more and more detailed. Um, but it's, I, I just was so blown away when I saw this. It was like, apparently I use a lot of blue, but also <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's so interesting that it, that it, Kind of, it's creating new stuff. None of this uh, uh, was actually in my work. It's like trying to, mm -hmm. at the bottom, the bottom left, you can see it's kind of like trying to make a mountain or something. So it's uh, still based on your work. Yeah, yeah. The data okay. set is is learned. So in this example yeah. would be, um, the generator tries to make images that look like my work, and the discriminator has to say if if it came from the generator or if it came from me. Yeah. And that's how the how it um, learns. Yes. And yeah. the next bit that I have is um, where I try to uh, combine the work of uh, Rembrandt van Gogh and uh, Rembrandt. Or, <laughs> I said it because that's the whole that's yeah. the whole thing. We yeah. said they're combining it, but Rembrandt and uh, van Gogh. Mm -hmm. uh, so I made a data set of both of their paintings. I think I used 400 uh, paintings or something. It took me a few days to gather them, mm -hmm. um, and I let it run. And I was super interested in in. Uh, if it could find a way to kind of like combine the two styles because I love both the painters, but their styles are super different. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. So this would be an exhibition where the styles are combined. And what I find super cool here is that you can actually mm. start seeing some type of portraits. And uh, those are obviously from, from Rembrandt and then they kind of animate with something called the latent space interpolation, which I don't understand at all what it is, but that's what it's called. Uh, you can start recognizing some, uh, yeah, like portraits and landscapes, and I'll have, I'll have a better view mm. of it in, uh, in another slide in a bit. Maybe also interesting to point out, you, it's not only the work, I mean, in a way it's a classical way of presenting, like the, it's a, but it's also a futuristic museum. I really like your sort of lighting coming uh, from uh, some, yeah. somewhere. Probably fake trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fake trees. Um, but also there are moving paintings in a, in a yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, that's the latent space interpolation. And I wish I could explain how it works, but I really don't. Um, it's, it's somehow it's animating between all the possible uh, uh, outcomes and you can get uh, an infinite amount of hours of animation out of mm. the program. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it's the animation is also super specific. It looks like kind of like psychedelic 
really super weird <laughs> it's movement. pretty psychedelic yeah, yeah, Did, yeah. Can, can you kind of can you direct that can you slow it down because yes okay so yeah. so you are the director of this piece in in that sense you yeah. are still the creator of this yeah but you also there's also many aspects of it that you actually don't con really control or don't really know how it works yeah so and you'll see that a lot with machine learning is these yeah. things get so complex and because you know, a neural network is kind of a copy of a brain. You can't really look inside to see what exactly it's doing, mm. which is kind of scary. But um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely, you also, of course, play a big role as an artist when you're using this stuff. It's not just the computer making it by yourself. It's not mm -hmm. you making it by yourself, you know? Yeah. Um, and then if I go to my next slide. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> I thought at the end, I was like, you know, f fuck it. Why are th why are the visitors might as well also be fake. So this is from yeah. Um, uh, you might have seen this before. It's from uh, uh, made with a data set called Celeb HQ, which is a, an AI upscaled uh, data set of thirty thousand images of random celebrities. Yeah. Put through yeah. the same program, and then it starts creating people that don't exist, but you might like <laughs> recognize some parts of their faces. Like, oh, is that Michael yeah. Jackson? Yeah. But um, all of these people are fake. And VIP, very, so you got yourself a very good audience. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. And they can't sue me for, for showing this because they don't <laughs> exist, which is also a nice bonus. Because every time they're not completely who they are, so they're always yeah, a yeah, bit yeah. inter, so they're never suitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's never an actual copy of a person. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Here's a bigger, uh, a better view at the, at the exports of the mm -hmm. Rembrandt van Gogh. Like the Freudian slip I had, and uh, did you did you um, nu nuance this a lot? Like, did you like where there? How did you select? How did you create? Because you didn't create the algorithm. No, I didn't. So not. how did you look for outcomes that were interesting? How did you do um, that process? Right, I. That's a good question. There is a lot of there's a lot of different. Um, uh, generative algorithms out there and they all have uh, with like varying degrees of results this is one the first one that I used that I showed in the beginning which was with my work that was kind of super low resolution and you'll find with all of these they're not very high resolution because the longer you let it run the, the mm -hmm. better quality you'll get it didn't have a lot of time but um, this one the algorithm that I used for Rembrandt and Van Gogh was super interesting because it the way it works is that it starts with super low pixel dimensions and then it goes up and it goes up and it becomes really uh, much more detailed than you would get mm. out of another one, and mm. I didn't really, I didn't really cherry pick the results. This is what came. All I actually, all I adjusted was the the speed of the animation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you were you were happy to sort of receive whatever outcome yeah. was coming out. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious what what it's gonna come up with. I mean, <laughs> it's so weird how it, how it tries to combine the two styles in an animation. I find the in between phases really interesting. Yeah, but then why did you choose Rembrandt and Van Gogh? I just um, I d there's just two painters that I that I really like and they have such different uh, art styles that mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to give the computer a challenge like okay what mm -hmm. if I throw what if I combine two super different uh, styles of paintings what is it kind of come out is it just gonna be like oh I don't uh, leave me alone you know yeah, I'm not yeah. gonna do anything yeah. or or is it gonna try to combine the styles somehow and. Mm, that, yeah, it's interesting because I was just wondering, like, if we if we walk out of the door here and uh, we're right in Amsterdam, um, and we we walk up to many uh, coffee shops who are selling also maybe uh, Rembrandt smoking weed or you know, <laughs> like we have all this kind of, yeah, they're not deep fakes, but they're all these kind of fakes that also uh, imitate the, the style. So yeah. that's also why it's kind of recognizable for me, like that it already is this this style that has been faked a lot. So, yeah, so yeah. in that sense, for me, it also kind of refers to the next step of doing this and yeah. moving it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. Cool. Rembrandt has been, I think there was a project where they tried to create his next paintings called The Next Rembrandt. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not sure who did it, but they, they yeah. actually also used the machine to paint it and they were like, could this, this is theoretically speaking, the, ne the, the next Rembrandt that was made after he, he died, but, um, it's it's made by a computer and it's kind of just like a more of a generic version of his paintings. It's yeah. just uh, just 
visibly uh, like the landscapes in a way yeah like yeah you can just recognize a new it. work from yeah. the old ones yeah, yeah. but you yeah. don't know what the artists themselves if they would have kept you know making the same type of work or if you would get something completely new a computer couldn't couldn't have done that yeah no. um but so obviously i was kind of joking in the beginning with whether computers are going to be replacing artists um yeah May I ask you a question? Yeah, maybe? please, go ahead. I think, you know, a big part of the value of a, a painting is also uh, lies within the author that gives the painting its partly its value, not only a bodies on the, on the painting, but also who created it. Yeah. And while, you know, when computers are able to create paintings, what will be the value of, of paintings? Have you... And yeah, ideas about it, and, so. and who is the author then? That's also really yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. funny thing yeah. is that you're saying like, okay, we have these computers and we are making stuff, and then we have these authors making stuff. But who made? There's always somebody who made those computers. Even if we, even yeah. if we put them on an island and let them create themselves for I don't know how hundred years, and then we look, we come back to the island and see what came out. Who's the author? So yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, I don't even, I have no idea how to answer that. It could mm. be the computer, <laughs> yeah. it could be me, it could be mm. Rembrandt and Van Gogh. I don't, I don't know who, who owns uh, these specific yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and are we the author? Oh, sorry, am I, am I doing something with the sound? Okay. Um, yes. Also the question, uh, are we the author of ourselves? I mean, so it, it point, right, like, yeah. like, I mean, maybe my, maybe my mother influenced me so much and, and my mm -hmm. high school and my friends and uh, American television. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like. Yeah, it's the same question. It's, yeah. it's like, depends what your, what your um, definition of, of author would be, mm -hmm. but um, I'm not sure how to answer it. But to get back to what I was yeah. trying to say, or you, you wanted to no, say no, something? No, no, that was, no. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so obviously we're not going to be replaced uh, as artists because um, the thing that computers are missing at the moment is critical thinking. And as an artist, you have to apply a lot of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And the computer by themselves wouldn't be able, to, wouldn't decide to use Rembrandt and Van Gogh paintings. It needed me to, to do that and to uh, have a good reason for it. So... Computers at the moment, it seems, they're not going to be able to replace critical thinking um, in the near future, at least. But then that begs the question, okay, what is going to be replaced? Um, I wanted to show a very, very boring project that I had to do a couple <laughs> weeks ago. Um, you had to do it. That sounds yeah, really, yeah, yeah. That sounds really school, schoolish to me. Uh, so well, it's just for, for work. It's not what I... Um, okay. Uh, just something All specific. Right. It was compositing. I'm not, I don't like to do compositing very much. But so there we had this shot of... Um, uh, a, fl a floor mm. and some people walking onto the uh, couch um, and the client said that the floor was too dirty and that we needed it to clean up which you would do in post so I was kind of like a digital janitor for three days which is mm -hmm. amazing uh, but so yeah. you can see here all the mess because somebody's walking through it you have to mask it out uh, <laughs> to get to get um, you know to get like a uh, uh, a, a good uh, that you only change the floor and that you don't clean up somebody's shoes and so it's a lot of uh, what in Dutch you would call pixel neuke, yeah, yeah, which you yeah. would uh, you have um, to like, which can be translated into pixel, pixel fucking, fucking which, yeah, which, which is pretty accurate, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a miniature miniature work, yeah, definitely, yeah, 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 taking ages, yeah, it's it's so tedious, but it's it's these types of jobs that that will be replaced because this yeah. isn't creative work; it's just image recognition and just manual labor. And once you just teach a computer how to do this, w which we can with uh, machine learning, we're like almost there, I think, to have this commercially yeah. available, then you won't have to be doing, this is called rotoscoping, by the way. So you have to manually, each frame, cut something out of uh, um, an image. And that just leaves, for more, uh, leaves more time for the creative process. If you're not, uh, if you don't, if you're not, um, you have to do this stuff just because uh, it's part of the process, yeah. but nobody really enjoys doing them. Yeah. So you're optimistic because it gives you kind of more space to create. Yeah, exactly. And like it helps the important you create. Parts. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to you don't have to worry about just technical stuff or like super yeah. tedious tasks. Um, but so the way uh, what what ended up happening, which I didn't even realize, is I, mm. I use machine learning as a, an artistic medium with my project, um, and I started doing research on on who else is using art uh, mm -hmm. machine learning as an artistic medium. And I found, I have two examples of uh, really interesting art artists that I found. 
Uh, one is uh, Refik Anadol. It's an he's an artist from uh, Turkey, hmm. and he does these machine hallucinations where. Um, uh, for example, this is uh, a project uh, or an exhibition that he did where he translated wind data of Istanbul through machine learning and, mm. and created some kind of visual language in, in displaying this type of data. And it's all really, really interesting. And it looks, uh, again, it kind of looks psychedelic, trippy. Uh, yeah. But Definitely. but it's interesting how, how that, that for him was like, um, it was like sort of a translation tool to translate that data, which is just numbers into something visual that, that kind of... More expressive. You know? Yeah, it expresses yeah. it more and it's more visually interesting and kind of mm. makes you feel something. Yeah. And he has a whole team behind him. He's doing uh, he's doing a lot of really big exhibitions. And another mm. uh, artist was... I have no idea how this guy does this. His name is Memo Akten. He's also very active in the NFT carbon footprint debate that's going on. But here, like, oh. I don't... This is he does that's interactive beautiful. stuff where he's, he's like, here, he's moving some car keys and... A thing around and, and the machine uh, learning algorithm was creating uh, flowers for it and he also does normal exhibitions of course mm. but what I really like about uh, uh, Memo is that he actually I think he's also <laughs> a coder and this I don't even know what this is but it's I just thought it was super cool he understands yeah. the, uh, the the algorithms and the program yeah. much much better than I do I only like understand the surface level and he can actually make all these super weird interactive it's things it's very intriguing what is yeah, happening there it's, it's so, it's, strange. It's so yeah. in between everything yeah 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 very very cool so in what way can machine learning help artists well I have some uh, uh, examples of just really specific uh, algorithms um, here for photo editing, uh, you can see on the top left, you can edit a photo of a car to change the rotation. Uh, I don't know why you would want to do that, but you, you can. Uh, it's just, I, you, it would be impossible to do it by hand. It's really cool. And in the top right, you can see relighting and re-rotating uh, an image of a person. Uh, bottom left, you see uh, making an image 3D. Bottom right, you see repainting a painting by changing the head <laughs> angle. Um, and these are all machine learning algorithms that these are not really publicly available as to use in programs, mm -hmm. but these are uh, oh, these are from a YouTube channel called Two Minute Papers uh, with what? Uh, two? two Minute Papers. He uploads uh, uh, like a new uh, a thing that he found um, relating to machine learning most of the time, like every week. Mm -hmm. And there's this I only chose a handful, but he has hundreds and hundreds of videos of really, really interesting uh, algorithms. I was starting to turn my head also, <laughs> <laughs> it's like rotating. I think yeah. you imagine rotating a head of somebody in a painting, it's so strange. And it's also, it, it works pretty perfectly, but for instance, Picasso worked a lot with the imperfection of turning, you know, True. of having yeah. those different yeah, yeah, yeah. moments in time and those kind of artistic choices, of course, yeah. wouldn't be made. Uh, exactly, by, yeah, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't run it on a Picasso yeah. painting, yeah. No, that would be... Get messy, I think. It yeah, well, messy. actually, it would be interesting to see. Yeah. Maybe somebody's yeah. done that. No. Um, and here's some other uh, tools. Uh, okay, these, like, these really blew me away. On the bottom left, you can see uh, an algorithm creating a whole 3D model from just a photo or a video and even creating the backside, which is, it doesn't know, it doesn't have access to that, but it just figures out, oh, this is probably what it looked like. And the top two... Uh, it might be uh, really handy for if you're, excuse me, if you're doing concept uh, concept art where you mm -hmm. choose a brush that says this is a rock and you paint uh, a shape and then on the right it synthesizes a photorealistic image of whatever you just painted. So if you need like mm -hmm. super specific reference material mm -hmm. of specific compositions, you can just Jesus, yeah. draw it, it goes really, really basic. Easy, easy. So Mm -hmm. you, just, yeah. you just make one line and it just makes a very realistic... Yeah, and the top landscape. right one is actually, it has an online free demo. It's from NVIDIA. I'm, mm. I'm not sure what it's called, actually. Probably <laughs> try drawing to image NVIDIA machine learning. It will probably come or up. Or Bob Ross algorithm. Or <laughs> Bob Ross algorithm. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like, it just does, does this and then there's a tree. Yeah, just Bob Ross.exe. <laughs> <that EXE. laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and, the, and the bottom right is uh, actually really cool for my uh, 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 field of work. It's It's creating motion tracking from a video, mm. which oh. normally you need super expensive mocap suits and cameras yeah. everywhere in a really specific studio. Yeah. And they figured out a there. way. I've been there. Yeah. You have? Yeah, I've been, I've been actually um, tying myself 
uh, in while being in a in a motion capture suit to pretend to be a worm. Like I had to make the motion data <laughs> for a worm and had to be warmed to make the arms? motion data. Did they, did they tape your arms? Too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> oh they taped me. Yeah, yeah. You'd so, think there'd be an easier way to animate a worm. Yeah. <laughs> so this is this 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 would be the, the easier way would just be to to, to film to a film worm you instead. Yeah. Now uh, film a worm <laughs> yes. better, and then mm -hmm. and then to just take the motion data from that worm, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and oh, there's wow. what's That's what's super cool is that advanced. Yeah, if they if no. they also make it for for animals, I think right now it's just based on humans. But yeah. what's cool is about you immediately have a huge database of because you just have to find a video of it and and that's it. You can extract the the data from there. Mm -hmm. And um, right now you have to have like super either you have to have somebody animate it, which is mm -hmm. super time consuming and expensive, or you uh, uh, get mocap suits and get it into a studio and then it's super expensive. So this it's it's really cool. And we've talked about a lot of cool stuff, which brings oh. me to something a little bit more scary. Yay. Deep fakes. Whoa. Um, so this is uh, a video of a live deep fake happening with, with, a, with a webcam where you have the source actor who's um, yeah. uh, affecting, in this case, George W. Bush. Yeah. Um, and you can, uh, you can see this combined with like an image or a voice yeah. synthesis uh, uh, algorithm where you just give somebody uh, a data set of just some Ooh. recordings of somebody talking. Also works on sculptures, which is actually Ooh, pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, you also see it also works on the, the... Putin works really well. On the Mona Lisa as well. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah, but that doesn't work cool. because <laughs> Mona Lisa doesn't move. Yeah. Sorry. Well, uh, she can. <laughs> yeah, I'm no, confused. you're right. It's just funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you couple this with like a, a voice synthesized machine learning algorithm where you just give it a data set of, of, let's say you take a podcast where somebody talked on, you give it a data set of that person speaking, you type something out and it will speak that for you and it sounds exactly like the person said it. Mm. You combine that with deep fake, you can see how that would um, uh, would become pretty scary if it's used uh, in, in, in a not so, yeah. in a bit of a sinister way. I, th I, I believe there was already um uh, uh, a guy who pretended to be uh, some kind of high, uh, high, uh, high one somewhere, mm -hmm. like a not a president, but but some, you mm -hmm. know, Somebody someone in the government with power, and he pretended just to be that person, but with having a mask and the, the clothes and a bit bad quality video, uh -huh. and had a sort of Zoom call with another very high-ranking government oh person, God. and just asked for money and got money sent to somewhere. Uh, just by faking to be this this person, oh so um, that there is that has been done already. That was done by a guy with a really bad plastic mask. Oh, so that wasn't even deep fake. No, there was, was no deep fake. So imagine what can be done with deep fake. So yeah, yeah, we're 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 gonna have to be attentive on the details. And, yeah, uh, exactly. We're gonna have to be. Uh, yeah. We're gonna we're we're gonna have to uh, look at things differently. That's maybe. crazy. That's just he was just like yeah. mm, looks like him. I'll send him a couple hundred grand. Yeah. Okay. No. I have I have a really funny example, or I don't know, funny, but one of the best examples that I found of a deep fake, which is Tom Cruise. Uh, it's it's at Deep Tom Cruise on TikTok. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's on TikTok, but um, <laughs> so it's like one of the best deep fakes I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. You'll see here also this guy uh, VFX Chris, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Yumi. Mm -hmm. I don't know on on YouTube kind of shows, but this is the data set that they use. You know Tom Cruise movies, and then you can see. Uh, th um, in a minute, the face being pasted on there, and it looks so Fuck. real, it's unbelievable. Oh, God. And he combines it also with some compositing, because you get sometimes art artifacts <laughs> when you have occlusions for deepfakes, but you can mask that out if you knew, if you know a little bit of After Effects. Um, so I first saw this on on uh, on Sorry, TikTok. Sorry, I just find, find that guy very scary. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I I don't know. I don't like Tom Cruise. That yeah. Much. The only reason, the only uh, way that I knew that it was fake is I thought Tom Cruise wouldn't be on TikTok. Uh, otherwise, ah. I would have I would have definitely uh, believed oh, it. Oh God. This and his face. What what helps is that his face already. He kind of has a similar face shape, so it it works really really well. Yeah. So the question arises, like, okay, how would you how would you be able to tell? Um, what th that something is a deep fake. Well, there's something called face forensics where there's algorithms that can detect deep fakes pretty well. Um, mm. and, um, but for some reason, there's an opposite algorithm which um, makes, makes it undetectable 
kind of like where you have those image labeling uh, algorithms where it's like you give it an image of a bus and then it will tell you this is a mm -hmm. bus and then you run it through a different algorithm that adds noise that we can barely see but changes the image in such a way that now the algorithm thinks it's a duck and not a bus and kind of the same is happening uh, here where you can tell that's obviously really fake face and at first it gets it but then you run it through this faking algorithm and then all of a sudden it thinks it's a real face I don't mm. really know what these people yeah yeah so yeah. yeah yeah it just it just it's like a a, um, a deep fake detector faker yeah so yeah. it seems like they're kind of going back and so forth this can and go and on forth. and on yeah. and on and on like a deep fake faker at? for the deep fake faker for the deep fake faker yeah yeah. Okay. yeah so at first when i saw there's like a detection i thought okay this is like a partial solution i mean not everybody's going to run a detector but uh yeah. if you would want to know but apparently those can be faked so oh um, shit yeah it's kind of scary um yeah, that was my presentation. Those are all the examples that Thank I wanted you. to Thank you. Yeah, you definitely scared us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, that was my goal. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's let's go to Roshan and be so that we also after that can have time to uh, discuss uh, a bit. But Roshan, you you approached actually from a very different angle or very personal angle. Um, yes. Um, so please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, then I have to take this remote and then I can click through my presentation uh, yes I have been graduated uh, uh, from the Dutch Film Academy uh, in 2020 as a documentary director uh, with my uh, documentary deep fake therapy and as the title suggested uh, I use deep fake in combination with therapy and uh, this is a poster of the, of the documentary mm -hmm. And in this documentary, um, bereaved family members uh, who lost their loved one or a family member are going to have a video conversation with their passed away loved one uh, using this new deep fake technology. And uh, I have a small trailer, a small piece yeah. of the documentary, so we can watch that. So to get a little bit of an impression uh, yeah. of the documentary, it's very short. Even de koptelefoon aanmaken. Nou, dus als je de koptelefoon opzet. Hij staat er aan hoor, je kan hem gewoon. Uh... Ja, dat is geen links en rechts. Mm, mm, van, nee, ik geloof niet. We zetten hem gewoon zo. Nou, even. Nou, als je zover bent, Ruud, dan uh, kan je hem opzetten en. Uh, ja. Oké. Okay. Hey. Hey meis. <laughs> Dat is apart. <laughs> Hallo. <laughs> Yes, so that was the starting of the documentary and it started with this title that you're going to watch an experiment because uh, it was truly the first time we did this experiment. And uh, You can really see that they're touched already. Yeah, I mean, the, this the is just a short fragment, but I saw the whole documentary. I was, I was um, crying. Um, it was very emotional. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you saw it too? I saw it too, yeah. Yeah, it is yeah. actually, you can see that the people are so touched. Yes, yeah. uh, absolutely. That uh, all those people who uh, participated in the experiment, they were all deeply touched. And they were all so happy that they had a chance to spoke to their loved ones again. And of course, that make, made us all happy uh, that, because it was ook very well, exciting for us. They're deepfake loved ones, right? So. Yeah, but... For them, uh, they, they, they were the actual loved ones. 
because uh, they can stick to that feeling that it, mm. it is true and they had the experience that it is true. Mm. So in my presentation, we're going to talk about that from what is true and what is not true. But yeah. um, this whole experience started with my grandmother. She died uh, now uh, six years ago mm. of a heart attack. And we have a picture of my grandmother. I need to click this. Ah, oh wait, it's uh, another picture. That's not my grandmother. <laughs> Maybe I have to... Yes, yeah. this is my oh, yeah. grandmother. And Nani, you say, right? Nani, yes, we yeah. say Nani. Nani. Uh, that's from the, the Indian culture, from the Hindu culture, we say Nani. So, um, and uh, I had a very good bond with her always, and she died from a heart attack, and suddenly you have no chance of saying goodbye. Uh, so she, from the one moment to the other moment, she just died, and there was no chance to say goodbye or to... Uh, afscheid nemen, to, yeah, to say your goodbyes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I was following... To process it, kind of. Yes, to give yes. It a, to give it a place. Yes, and, yeah, yes. Didn't there's, no end it. there's no closure. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, I was following this deepfake developments, mm -hmm. uh, this deepfake technology, and uh, I, have, uh, s I have seen that it is possible to make these deepfakes, which you have been talking about, and maybe I have uh, made a video in which we can see how this deep fake uh, works. We have a very small video of it. This yes, yes, deepfake. indeed. There's the actor. This is from uh, the, the people who made this software, 3D Universum. And uh, as you can see, you know, one person is uh, moving his face. And then Donald Trump is his same facial expression uh, he has. So uh, I saw this piece for, from 3D Universum. They make all this kind mm -hmm. of, of deep fakes yeah. technology. Yeah. Yeah. And then I thought like, hey, with this deep fake technology, maybe I can have a video conversation with my grandmother. And I thought about let's take a voice actor and put her in another room and make sure we have a good audio connection so that she can live steer the facial expressions of my grandmother. And we tried that experiment on the Film Academy and, uh, and at that time there's also a grief therapist involved who was also there at that day on the Film Academy. And we just thought like, let's try it and see how it works. Mm. And we also have a short film about that, where you see me talking with my uh, grandmother. <laughs> your, your grandmother that you kind of created. Yes. Interesting. Oh, meet you. Hello? Roshin. Hello, Nani. Roshin, how is it? Yeah, yeah. Ja, met mij gaat het goed, Nani. Je bent druk, zo te zien. Ja, we zijn uh, op dit moment heel erg bezig uh, met, met mijn eindexamenfilm. Ik ga afstuderen aan de filmacademie, Nani. Wauw. Weet je dat ik helemaal vergeet dat jij dat bent? Holy crap! Oh, hey man. Wat zijn we aan het doen, man? Ook die stem heb je dan, dat vergeet je ook. Jeetje. Vergeet je dat ook? Is, dat ze soms precies zo lachte naar mij op sommige momenten. Oh mijn hemel. Ze was daar echt hoor, Kim. Dit ben jij niet geweest. 
Nee. Jeetje, en ik voelde meteen van, oh man, wat is er afgelopen vier jaar gebeurd? En dat moet ik allemaal vertellen. En... Vooral de momenten dat ze zei waar ze was en dat ze trots op je is wat je doet. Dat is... Uh... Leon. Dat ben jij hoor, dit. <laughs> <laughs> Zou jou het vragen? Nou. Wow. Yes. Can I ask you something? Sure. It seemed, it seemed like it was really easy for you to suspend your disbelief. Like the, the fact that it was a voice actor and not, not your actual grandma. That it that it didn't even matter in the end to you. Yeah, Is it, that right? it didn't even matter indeed. Wow. It was, I, uh, before I did this, I had not the idea that it would be so strong the effect because I knew my colleague, the producer of the film was in the other room playing my grandmother. I knew that mm -hmm. with my ratio. Yeah. I knew how this deep fake thing works. And still I had this sensation that mm. I spoke to my grandmother I was coming home that day and I was like saying to my mother, like, hey, mom, I spoke with Nani. And she's like, hell. So, but, and that's the thing. The sound is not correct. And the image was a little bit jerky, a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. But your head is making the connections together. You know, one plus one is three. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my imagination, I have saw my grandmother speaking fluently to me and asking questions and mm. wow and that brought me to the question what is real and i have also put that question in my powerpoint slide yeah <laughs> <laughs> what is real yeah because uh did, yeah did you yeah because it, it does it help it, it sounds maybe strange but does it help to grieve like does it help to be because uh, for instance, when my father died, I, I had a um, sort of hallucination that you that I saw saw my father, yeah. and I could just hoover around him like a 3D, like yeah. a, as if he was like a 3D kind of object almost. But he was so real, and your our memories of our loved ones are so strong. And once they yeah. die, we can see them everywhere. We go to a supermarket, and we're like, it, uh, "That's him," yeah. you know, and. So does it kind of help that people grieve to sort of add to the illusion? Maybe? Well, actually, what we saw in this experience that it did help them because mm -hmm. uh, we are doing this uh, our whole life, you know, um, talking to those who are not there anymore. That is something that humanity does for millions of yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, you know, we speak to our loved ones in our prayers, in our thoughts. Uh, and this is just you know, basically the same, only with a layer of technology on it. That's yeah. the only thing. But so it's easier. It makes it yeah. easier. So uh, I think especially if it's something really sudden, like with your grandmother, that it can yes. help you to kind of bridge. Then it's not so sudden because there's still a little bit of a contact and then you can choose yourself to kind of close it off and get closer. Indeed, you do it all for yourself to give a closure for yourself. Mm. And uh, that is indeed the, the power of, of this new instrument. Mm. And that also relates to the question, what is real? Because in the end, it happens all in your, in your brain. Uh, there is this wonderful quote of the scene from The Matrix. Uh, I have also cut it from YouTube and, and put it in my presentation. Maybe we can have a look at it. Yeah, that's, you want to see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I wanted to know what The Matrix is in the end. Trinity.
This is the construct. It's our loading program. We can load anything from clothing to equipment, weapons, training simulations, anything we need. Right now, we're inside a computer program? Is it really so hard to believe? Your clothes are different, the plugs in your arms and head are gone. Your hair has changed. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This, this isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Ja, die laatste quote hè, van... Uh, it's just electrical signals interpreted by your brain. En als dat je definitie van echt is... Ja, dan heb ik toch echt met mijn oma gesproken. Want mijn signalen in mijn hoofd... Die, all the signals was making the connections. Ja. So, uh, then, you know, also this color of this pen. We see it as blue. Mm. But it's an illusion, you know. It just absorbs all kind of waves yeah. from the sun. But only the blue waves are reflecting yeah. and my brain interprets that as blue so that i see this as blue is actually a, an illusion so or a phenomenon that's yes right. yeah, yeah, yeah. and so you're saying the question doesn't even matter what's real or not well that's that's well, well that's the thing uh, like how yeah. do we treat that maybe as artists like how do or as human beings yeah. how do we treat What is real? How, uh, yeah, how do you define real? And of course, for everybody, you have some different answer to it, but mm -hmm. that's my answer. Mm. Maybe because I'm a magician, I have uh, yeah. doing magic all my life, so... So, so the effect to you, you, you kind of define real by the effect. Like, if you have this, this electronic sort of, you have this, this effect yeah. on the brain, yeah. then that's, then the, as a magician, you, you, you created reality. If it feels mm. real, if it tastes yeah. real, if it smells real, For then me, it then it is real. Also, mm. you know, even if it's not real, but then for me, it's real. If all my senses mm. interpret it mm. as real, then for me, it's mm. real. Mm. So, um, and you know, it also says but that. But do you say that as an artist, like as a director, because that's that's the, huh? because then you're the magician, or also or also as a person? Yeah, both. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because you know, as a director you're also creating illusions all the time, mm -hmm. you know, when Even you... Even for yourself. Yeah, but also mm -hmm. in film, you know, when we watch mm -hmm. film, it is an illusion. Even documentaries, it, it is all a constructed illusion which you create in the head of the spectators. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes. <laughs> so you don't, yeah, so that, that would actually, that would make uh, the people in Netflix killing people, uh, in a way, uh, they would be real murderers. Because, I mean, I, I get that. Yeah. I, I always have the feeling like, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, but of course. And like, it, it's yeah. really painful, and, but it's fiction. But maybe the fiction is actually as real as the reality we have. At That's that a question moment, yeah. that, we're, that we're posing more and more because of deep fakes. Because the blur between of reality course. and what we create. Because uh, that's yeah. why we love film, right? Because when you see a film at that moment, mm -hmm. it is real. It is happening inside your brain. Then we can truly feel real emotions when we watch a fake film, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's the same process. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering like how, how as, uh, as artists we yeah. can deal with this. Like how um, um, are we just gonna say that everything is as real as, as the other thing or are we gonna still make distinctions? Uh, and are there hierarchies in these distinctions? So yeah. how do you think about that? So I just... Um I just think it's a problem with the question more than more than uh, the question like of what is real. What is real? It, it just depends on what your definition of real is. I mean, mm -hmm. l like things that might be fake to you can be real to other people. It's But just do we need a definition? I think we don't. It just it you, just we don't. We just live. We just create. We just do. We yeah, unless I there's a, there's a hmm. whenever the question somehow becomes really important for something specific. I can't really. Um, 
I guess in philosophy maybe you would try to yeah, figure it out. Yeah, I'm a philosopher, so right, I'm like yeah. I'm I'm trying to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think when it when it becomes when it becomes important, I think in um, this might be somebody asked like, okay, yeah, so you had deep, you had a, a fake version of uh, your grandma, for example. And they're like, yeah, but it's not real. But that question doesn't matter because if it's real to you, that's what matters. So in that specific instance, that question yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. But oh, if you're, yeah. But that's how I look yeah, at it. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Uh, it's two to one. <laughs> yeah, it's two to yeah, one. I'm no. sorry. Yeah, but the I, I think I'm, I'm I'm from the old school for new philosophers. You know, <laughs> how we, do you, we, how we do so you look somehow at it? we care about what, what is real. Yeah. But how do you how do you look at it? Um, well, I I. Um, I started to look at it in a more cultural way, to say like, okay, real is, uh, I, I actually gave a lecture in, in, in the United States once in Asheville on uh, reality is that which is at stake. Uh, and it was for a media art uh, festival because we were playing so much with our reality, like hybrid reality, different kinds of reality. It was really not clear anymore, like what, what was real and what was meaningful about that realness and if it had consequences. So if you have, for instance, social media, it has consequences. Mm -hmm. So there's something at stake, so it is real. So to say if there's something at stake. So you could say mm -hmm. your, maybe your grandmother wasn't alive, but there was still something at stake because your emotions were still really at stake. Mm -hmm. So it yes. was meaningful, meaningfully real. So, so, so then so for me, reality is sort of connected to meaning and is it meaningfully real? But maybe we should yeah, continue. Yeah, no, yeah. But th this is interesting <laughs> because for me, those are not really connected. For me, it's all about the meaning. Like if something fake has a very powerful meaning to me, for me, the meaning is importance. You know, for me, it's th why do we have millions of religions in the world, you know? And it's about the meaning that people have to those religions, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe all those stories are maybe not even historically correct or true, or maybe there are mistakes in it, but it doesn't matter because people have a meaning to it, and it's all about the meaning. Yeah, but then, so then you can't say everything. I mean, there's still things that, I, I mean... For instance, people are saying like, yeah, the environmental issues are not real, but but a lot of scientists tried to prove it was. I mean, there's still some kind of distinction between things we did, that, like uh, trees falling on our head because of gravity. And uh, so... I think what you mentioned is super interesting and in how um, in, in your talk you had to de def define or give a uh, final way to define what real is and you did it through linking it to if it has consequences or not. I think that's a really interesting way to to define because how would you define what's real i wouldn't even know where to start with yeah that. and also how to define its consequences the culture kind of defines that if right. if social media was something that was super unimportant it wouldn't have consequences but yeah. as it became more important it also became more real in that sense mm -hmm. so that's interesting how 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 there's not one definition to you cannot say like social media per se is not real but as soon as i'm going into it and it starts to get big culturally it starts to get real but mm -hmm. maybe we should head on to uh, because <laughs> because we're talking here about deep, we're very, yeah, we're deep on fake here. We're, we're, yeah, we're going deeper into the deep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's go further into the into the fake. Yeah. Okay. So what is real? Um, the thing is that I noticed that w after my conversation with my grandmother, I had mm -hmm. this feeling that our brain had the ability or the capacity capacity to see and hear what it wants to see and hear. So uh, that for me was a very interesting thing that, uh, you know, what is real, it, it doesn't matter that much because yeah. our brain just wants to hear and see what it wants to hear or see. Um, and at that point, uh, after the exper experiment with my uh, grandmother, we thought, Okay, let's let's make a true experiment of it, and uh, let's make a graduation documentary about that experiment. Yeah. It was at that time very hard. Like, uh, should I do this experiment as a director with voice actors and bereaved family members, or should a renowned grief therapist should lead this experiment? Mm -hmm. And we chose for the last uh, option yeah, because you really got a specialist on grief. Right? Yes, yeah, indeed, uh, because yeah. I I did not know how to prepare a voice actor. You know, uh, of course, on the film academy you get a lot of, you know, uh, uh, acting, how to direct actors. But I am not prepared how to 
prepare an actor w when he uh, is need to be the, in the role of the bereaved family member. Yeah, because mm. it actually affects like there's human lives that are affected, so it's best to ask mm. a professional that knows how to approach. Yeah, the, because that of stuff. this emotional consequences. Exactly, yeah, 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 yeah emotional indeed. Reality. You know, if, if yeah, I instructed yeah. the voice actor in not correct, then maybe it could have worse consequences. So therefore, we let this experiment be. Uh, we have this done by a renowned grief therapist. Yeah. And but then we had another problem. How are we going to find the candidates for this experiment? Mm -hmm. And Steve Jobs was also saying that yeah, people want an iPhone, but they don't know they want it because they are not aware of the existence of the iPhone. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> this was the Steve Jobs paradox. Like, yeah, we have this new tool, uh, but we somehow need to know to the public that this tool is available. Uh, otherwise, you know, people cannot... Uh, um, uh, Want you know, it. Yeah. yeah, they cannot sign up for the experiment. But at the same time, it is not like an iPhone we are selling. This is something very sensitive. Yeah. Uh, so it was very balancing on a very thin court. Like... We don't want to promote it like, hey, you know, buy this new iPhone. No. Come grieve here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it shouldn't be have that tune of voice. Mm. So we needed to do it very carefully. And we approached per all the people personally. And we chose with the grief therapists uh, people who, uh, who are very uh, geschikt, very... Uh, 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 yeah, fit, yeah. We, which we thought they could fit the experiment. Yeah. We have done, uh, we have made, ah, this is the therapist, uh, Leonique. She have led the, the experiment. Mm -hmm. And we have made also this uh, oproep, like mm. uh, for, you know, for if you want to speak to your um, family members and in the text below that you, I'm not sure you can read it. It says like, we are using new deep fake technology. And in the end, uh, the, uh, these are the four people who have uh, signed up for, for this experiment. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the result, uh, yeah, we're, uh, I think we have an uh, in start now. Uh, uh, yeah, let's video. Let's watch it. Let's yeah. watch it, yeah, yeah. Some family members in the. Are you alone there? No. Yes, not. No. 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 En hoe ziet het eruit daarboven? Het is licht. Zo erg licht. Was je, was je daar meteen al, de LXV? Je bedoelt of ik dit meteen ervaarde? Ja. ja. Nee, ik denk dat ik uh, eerst een beetje door een soort van tunnel ging. Ik vond het ook moeilijk om, om weg te gaan. Ik wilde eigenlijk helemaal niet zo snel, maar uiteindelijk is het wel beter. Voelt dit beter? Mooi. Als we het een keer moeilijk hebben, dan gaan we je hulp vragen. Hè? Ja. Maar soms wil je me ook herkennen in andere meisjes. Ja, dat vind ik soms ook lastig, ook als ik je vriendinnen zie. Die wel doorleven. Ja, maar... Door hen leef ik ook weer verder, man. Ja. En ben ik ook dicht bij jou. Je mag ervan genieten. Dat doen we ook. <laughs> ja. En ik blijf altijd bestaan. Altijd. En ik wacht op jullie. Ja, ik verwacht wel dat je netjes om me wacht als ik kom. <laughs> ja. Ja, zeker. Ja. We zien er allemaal uit, maar we gaan nog wel even door hoor. Op de aarde. Jullie, jullie zeker nog heel lang. Ja. Nog heel lang. <laughs> Very emotional. Can I say something? At first, well, I, I watched your documentary. Um, I thought it was very good. I, at first it made me really uncomfortable thinking that there's like a voice actor that's kind of playing uh, um, a dead uh, relative to these people. And I thought, oh, that's kind of like, you know, that's, that kind of feels like it's maybe takes away from the experience. But then you watch their reactions and it actually still affects them how you want, want it to affect them. And that kind of 
put me in a space where like okay maybe this is this was the right way to do it because it still clearly has a positive impact on them yes so was there was there um what was that thought process like we knew you needed to to have a voice and then you decided on using a voice actor in the next room yes well actually uh it started with with my grandmother like uh my experience was that it worked so good to have a voice actor because uh a voice actor what's happening he is reacting he or she is reacting pure or intuition and um, because you need to imagine that when a voice actor is speaking he or she is seeing the face of the uh, dead family member mm -hmm. so when i say hey mom how are you i see uh, my you know for example a uh, grandmother saying hey mom how are you so right. and the voice actor is feeling this connection with the with the the, the, the passed away loved one, mm -hmm. and that worked so well. And the thing is, they all say helpful, loving things. Uh, they are saying things that everybody wanted to hear. That I have no pain. It is so beautiful where I am here now, and you don't need to worry about me. And you know all kind of supporting words so uh, in that way it was like that, that made it so beautiful and therefore I, I felt very uh, comfortable using voice actors mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in this uh, experiment mm -hmm. but yeah. there is of course a question like how does the voice actor know what he or she needs to say and which agreements have been made and I have put it in a slide, ah. which agreements have been made between actors and family members? One of the most important mm. agreements is that the voice actor can always say, I don't know, mm. because that was one of the, the fears of, of yeah. actors. Like, like maybe I say something wrong, yeah, maybe yeah. I hurt them, maybe they worry. Maybe Indeed, I you know, yeah, yeah, perhaps yeah. the family members are saying a question that the uh, voice actor is not prepared on or he or mm. she doesn't know how to respond yeah. then the voice actor can say i do not know and the agreement have been made that the family members when they hear that they know oh the voice actor have no answer on this so they so they're still conscious of the agreement and still they go into the indeed illusion. indeed that's very intense that's yes very intense because we were also talking about how we yeah, how we maybe need this new criticality and how like do we need to develop our own face detectors for for deep fake yeah, for the deep fake recognition do we need to establish uh, a different way of looking at our reality um, but then yeah. but then if it's so easy to go to the solution while even having this consciousness on this agreement. Yes, I'm, I'm really yes. But that's, that's the thing. Our brain somehow sees and hears what it wants to see and hear. And you don't have to make the illusion complete. Also, if you make the illusion just a tiny bit, your brain makes it co pictures the whole pictures. Mm. So, and that's, you know, that is so part of who we are as, as humans. You want to believe in a beautiful story. But so as artists, we, we actually only have to do a very small part of this. And, yes. and make very uh, very good choices about how and when we do that. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's maybe also an interesting question. Like, maybe we're artists, but we're not ethicists. Like, it, we're going to very, you already were in a very ethical, uh, <laughs> stage you you were you, you yes you didn't go to an ethical commission to ask uh, like <laughs> uh, am I allowed to go into the emotional depth of, of uh, these grieved uh, people it's uh, really uh, consequential like do you, do you yes. do, um, maybe so hype do you feel like you're that, that you that you were in certain areas that you felt like I need to discuss this with someone right am yeah, I yeah. am I still in a okay as a person i think not to the point that uh at, that roshan had and uh, i actually uh, i asked you before we 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 started uh, we started this because you had another ethical question of like show in uh, if whether you sh would show the actual deep fakes of the people in your in your documentary or not yes yeah. because you 
can't ask them for consent because they're not alive anymore. And that was a, also a really wow. big question, which like you couldn't even, what, yeah. there's not going to be a law that immediately is like, oh, this, because this is all super new because you, yeah. so you don't Indeed. really know if, if that's allowed or not. Yeah, there's that, laws being established now. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. that's, yeah. Indeed, the next PowerPoint slide, so... <laughs> oh, wow. So yeah, yeah. I Classic PowerPoint. <laughs> there, yeah, in yeah. 10 years, they will uh, yeah. not have PowerPoints anymore, I hope. <laughs> the audiovisual concept, because <laughs> we were indeed experiencing this, this mm. problem that can mm. we or may we see the front side of the laptop? Yeah. And the thing is that when Which I spoke to my grandmother... We really want to see it, of yeah. course. But yeah, but the thing is, when I spoke to my grandmother, she in my head was very fluently and very, you know, no. very beautiful. And the fact on the laptop was that it was not that fluent. And no. it was like uh, we wanted to make the, the somehow the, the laptop make like a magical thing. That, that something magical is happening there. The magician in you yeah. again. That's yeah. the magician, magician. maybe, indeed, yeah. yeah. So, uh, therefore, we, we didn't show it immediately from the start. Uh, also, uh, there was this old thing, portrait right, uh, like uh, portrait right, I don't know the English word mm. for it. But, uh, you the know, the, laws and the law, of, there is no, there is in, in law, there is no, uh, there's no law. If you put someone else's words in another person's mouth, uh, yeah. and you know it's being done, not with yet, yeah. not yet. No. Yeah. Yeah. This is being co-produced with the Caro uh, and Cerve, it's a public MPO, mm -hmm. and we didn't want also in this, uh, you know, conflict like we have a claim, like hey, uh, this is my achter uh, achter yeah. achter uh, yeah. nichtje. Uh, so there were no laws, but still you had to kind of go yes, avoid yes, the laws. Yes. You couldn't ask the dead people to yes, consent. Yes, indeed. And also yeah. that we noticed in all kinds of test viewings that uh, we were um, stuit the mensen te veel tegen de borst. It was too much like, oh, ooh, in you know, like mm. that effect. And we chose for the more soft side and just focus only on the faces. It was too hard for people to, to watch. Like they felt kind of yeah, like witnesses indeed, huh, to see. Yeah, yeah, some test viewers felt it like uh, hard to digest when they mm -hmm. see the true yeah. true image mm -hmm. on, on the screen. And also on the filmmaking side, it kind of, uh, it might even work better when you don't show it because there's that little bit of mystery and there's, you don't Indeed. have to, you don't, you keep it a secret so people just imagine that it looks really, really good. Yeah, and the thing is, it I think it makes it more tightloos, more because you know the technology uh, timeless, is, is timeless, yeah. you know even now mm. it is now more than a year old almost uh, the yeah. technology it will improve even more more yeah. more more so and making it you know and not then it will be more powerful yeah and, so um, i thought let don't focus too much on on the gimmick no. focus on the expressions that then you have a time and a meaning that it can and have. a meaning it's yeah the indeed. cultural meaning it can be yeah. like a new way of talking to our deceased ones yeah, which yeah. a lot of ancient cultures used to do mm -hmm. like uh, yeah so yeah it's very in that sense your project is 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 using a new technique but it's a very ancient technique in a certain sense yes of 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 of, of uh, giving closure to about talking about closure, we also have to go come to an end uh, <laughs> with our deep, deep on fake. We went really deep, definitely. Um, uh, also uh, very fake. Who knows? I don't know. No. Um, I'm, I'm, I thought it was very interesting to to hear about this critic, uh, a new criticality, but maybe also when you need to be critical on something, you need a, a deep fake on a deep fake, uh, like a some. Um, how do you tackle? How do you tackle the fakeness of it? And do you need to tackle the fakeness or do you use it? Um, so those are interesting things. And also these ethical questions, how are we going to deal with it? As artists, maybe you had test viewers, which is a very interesting way of dealing with it. And maybe it's not like an ethical commission, but you, you were listening to your audience. Like, how do, do they digest it? So that's interesting uh, process. And maybe, uh, maybe we each... Uh, Maybe what, what did you get out of uh, today? What, what, what did you I'm still mind fucked with how you were like, oh, if the culture defines what real, I'm still like, it's still I'm trying to figure out what exactly that means. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting that we actually started that we came to a point where it was just like, okay, what's real and does it even matter? 
Um, and you have a really clear answer to that. And I found that really interesting because you really use that to kind of structure how you approach your project. I thought that was really interesting. I hadn't really thought about it. I, I just thought the... Um, so you're going to um, deep process that. Yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> it's going to be a long weekend. Yeah, yeah. just thinking. Yeah. yeah. No, I just thought it was, it was interesting that it came to that like super philosophical uh, question. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thanks. thought it cool. was a nice conversation. I, I really like the conversation, too. Me, too. Oh, Sean, you want to give a short closure? Do a magic trick. <laughs> 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 yeah, actually, uh, I'm very thankful to, to, to be here, and I find your part very, very inspiring. Ah, thanks, man. You, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can't hug. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I we can't hug. So yeah, we would have hugged, but... Yeah, we can't, we can't hug. So, for a fake hug... Whoa, deep fake, <laughs> hug. fake hug. Yes. All right. So that was deep fake. We did just did a deep fake hug uh, <laughs> here in Amsterdam in the Brackegrond, and we were very ha happy to have you all here and to have you, the viewer, uh, as well. So please go make deep fakes uh, and make them the weird, the weirdest deep fakes that we will ever see, and we hope to see them next year. Oh, All right. You're going to regret saying that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope next year to regret that. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>